Hey there, this lovely manhwa is titled Predatory Marriage, and if you love story like this, please like and subscribe. With her head still bent, she told him that she was not worried about the royal family, but about Estia. The innocent people that are not involved in this. She didn't want them to die in vain, she just wanted to escape from there. She held his cloak tighter, begging him. He went silent, then turned to caress her face, saying that she was testing his patience way too much. She attempted to speak, but she sounded weak and her words wouldn't come out. Concerned, Isha Khan asked her what she ate. Falling into his arms, she stuttered, saying that she was drugged with a drink. Her body felt strange. It was a lot warmer than just moments ago. Pulling her closer to himself, he kissed her. A long kiss. But it did nothing. The last time they saw Margrave Oberday with the gypsies, he must have bought one of their love potions. Stuttering, she asked him what she should do now. He replied that those love potions were just named as such. But in reality, why was it just a cheap mixture of drugs? Very few witches around there had the power to make real potions. He continued that, for her case, she would need an antidote. Taking her in his arms, he asked her what she was going to do. Her body was growing weaker and weaker. Struggling to utter the words, she begged him to do anything necessary. They heard Margrave's voice outside, yelling that she had come out already. She couldn't hide from him forever. He continued that if she came out at that moment, he would forget her insolent behavior. Her lower half was completely numb after that moment. He told her to stay still, or if she wanted him to help her with the antidote while Margrave was still around. But she couldn't endure anymore. Her body was shutting down, and so were her eyes. The night was still young. They had arrived. Isha Khan helped her sit up, saying that he knew she had a bad experience with toxic plants, but flowers were prettier. Slowly regaining her consciousness, she looked at the flowers around. And then he took off his robe, saying that he needed to start with her treatment. In the garden, they held each other closely. He told her they were alike when it came to intimate moments like this. Holding her tight, he asked for a kiss as she gazed at him with strong affection. Their passionate kiss was unlike anything they had experienced before, and she thought it felt incredibly good. She whispered his name, Isha Khan, and moaned. He looked deeply into her eyes and warned her not to be intimate with anyone else, especially Margrave Oberday, whom he had seen her talking to while he was outside smoking. Overwhelmed by their intense moment, she passed out. When she opened her eyes, she realized she was resting on his lap, with him gently patting her head. She noticed they were back in a familiar place, and she was grateful he had brought her back. Watching him smoke, she tiredly asked for water. He tenderly lifted her like a baby and kissed her, passing the water from his mouth to hers. She felt dizzy, but refreshed. He then placed his cigarette between her lips instructing her to sip it slowly, without biting. Following his instructions, she found the sensation refreshing. He soon removed the cigarette from her mouth, warning her that too much could be harmful. He gently laid her on the bed, noticing that she appeared to be feeling better. He covered her with a blanket and called her by her name, Leah. He wished her a good night's sleep as her heavy eyelids slowly closed, giving in to the comforting embrace of rest. Leah's life took a tragic turn due to a passionate love story. The king fell in love with a cheerful and honest country girl at a banquet. Her spirited nature captivated him, and soon this young woman from a small noble family became the queen of Estia. Without any support, the queen's vibrant spirit began to wither away. She clung to the king's love, but his feelings for her had already begun to fade. The queen's misfortune peaked when she gave birth to Leah after a difficult labor. She couldn't bear any more children and became infertile. The king, disappointed and distant, drove her out of the palace when Leah was just three years old. Young Leah ran after her mother, calling out, Mommy, as the maids tried to seize her. She managed to reach her mother's arms and they held each other tightly. Her mother tearfully apologized and advised Leah to obey orders stay strong, and never go against Serdina. She gently caressed her daughter, pouring all her affection into that last embrace. Soon after, the queen was found dead, her body cold and lifeless. 
The royal family announced that she had taken her own life, but no one believed it was suicide, except for one person. When Serdina entered the palace with a young boy, it caused an uproar. Why would she? Who's the father of her son? It was soon revealed that she had been involved with the king even before Leah's real mother, the deposed queen, was expelled from the palace. That's really crazy. Well, most kings are polygamous in nature, so I think his, the father of her son. The critical voices soon faded as it became evident that Serdina had the backing of a powerful family. Thought as much, life can indeed be really cruel to those without power. Her influence grew, and eventually, with the king's favor, Blaine was crowned as the crown prince. Those unaware of the truth behind Serdina's actions praised her for her kindness and virtue, believing she had raised Leah, a child not her own, with sincerity and love. Little did they know that Serdina was cunning and manipulative, subjecting Leah to abuse while keeping her true intentions hidden from the public eye, renowned for her exceptional accomplishments in education, career, and appearance. Leave truly embodied the essence of Estia's culture and elegance. Her refinement earned her the flattering title, Flower of Estia. In the morning, Leah woke up with a jolt, her eyes wide open. She had drunk a lot of alcohol the night before, and her body felt hot and uncomfortable. She groaned, wishing she could forget the events of the previous night, but the vivid and unsettling memories refused to fade. She couldn't help but feel disgusted by the vulgar and promiscuous details that lingered in her mind. Worried about the potential commotion in the palace, Leah wondered how she would handle the situation. Muttering to herself, she decided to return. Noticing someone at the door, she called for them to enter. A busty and large woman walked in, carrying a tray filled with various dishes. She introduced herself as Ginin, a loyal escort of Lord Ishakan, and expressed her honor in meeting Leah. Recognizing Ganin from the banquet, Leah exchanged awkward glances with her. Nevertheless, Leah politely responded that it was nice to meet her as well. Feeling uncomfortable under Ganin's exploring gaze, Leah covered herself with a blanket. Ganin apologized for her surprise at Leah's thin figure, begging for forgiveness for her rudeness. Leah pulled the blanket away, assuring her that it was okay, and murmured that her attitude was gentle, quite unlike her appearance. Ganon then placed the tray of dishes on the bed, explaining that she had prepared some simple food for Leah to enjoy. Wow, all these sweet dishes. Simple? Does it look like it? Leah glanced at the tray, amazed that Ganon considered the abundant assortment of food to be simple. Ganon explained that she had also brought various beverages, as she wasn't sure what Leah would enjoy the most. Leah chose a snack and some milk, informing Ganon that she was already full. Jenin examining Leah's small meal, questions whether she disliked the dishes, considering they were specially prepared for Estia's princess. Leah reassured her that she simply tended to eat little. Jenin held up a dish, asking once more if Leah wanted more food. Leah declined, insisting she was fine. Leah noticed a tattoo on Jenin's arm and inquired about it. Jenin explained that she had only one tattoo, as she initially believed all Kirken people had them. Surprisingly, even the king didn't have any tattoos, which typically symbolized victories in battles. Leah found this revelation quite interesting. As Genin picked up the tray to leave, Leah asked her to thank the king for his help the previous day. Genin agreed to deliver the message. Leah then requested some clothes so she could return to the palace. Genin offered to accompany her since Lord Isha Khan would be away. Dressed and walking down the hallway with Genin, Leah noticed the palace was unusually quiet, with no one there to greet them. Leah wondered if someone had arrived before her. Genin mentioned hearing footsteps in the hall. When Leah opened the door, she saw the maids lined up, looking tense. To her shock, Blaine was sitting there, sipping tea. He commented that she had returned early and that he had been waiting for her. Leah glared at him as he crossed his legs and sat majestically, addressing her as sister. Wow, what a stepbrother she's got there. Do you think he's going to be rude? Leah folded her hands tightly. She thought to herself that she should have anticipated Blaine rather than Serdina calling for her. She was at a loss for words. 
Blaine examined her from head to toe, complimenting her on how well the dress suited her. She modestly responded that she had received some help from others. Blaine got up and walked straight towards her. He gently caressed her face, questioning what kind of help she had received. She quickly pulled his hands away from her face, exclaiming that touching her face was unnecessary. He became furious and was about to hit her. She closed her eyes, bracing for the impact. Fortunately, Denon intervened, grabbing his hand to stop him. Blaine groaned as Janin squeezed his hand tightly, scolding him for his disrespect. Blaine angrily pulled away and turned to the frightened servants. He grabbed one of the male servants by the shirt and threw him in Leah's direction, causing the servant to fall into her arms. The other servants were terrified by Blaine's actions. Leah shouted at Blaine, pleading with him to stop. Blaine's face twisted into a scowl, his anger evident as he accused his sister of bringing shame upon their family. He insisted that he couldn't simply stand by and watch as their name was tarnished. He asked her if she knew about all the gossip around the kingdom about her. Leah yelled and called him his highness, trying to be polite even though things were getting crazy. She still held on to the scared servant and asked Blaine if he knew about the really bad things that almost happened to her the day before. Why just rush and start thinking of the thousands negatives instead of finding out the truth first before conclusion? As Blaine listened to his sister, he found himself at a loss for words. Leah pleaded with him not to hurt any more servants at the palace, as they were innocent. While she was speaking, blood began dripping from her nose. Blaine was surprised to see her bleeding. She touched her nose, realizing she was bleeding, and suddenly passed out. This shocked everyone, especially Blaine, as they watched her collapse to the floor. The lawless beings known as gypsies were infamous for their reckless behavior throughout the empire, as they had nothing to lose. Despite their fearless reputation, there was one group that the gypsies always tried to avoid, the Kirken tribe. While the gypsies traveled freely across the land, they never ventured near the western sand dunes where the Kirkens resided. The exact reason for their avoidance remained a mystery, but it was widely believed that the gypsies harbored a deep fear of the Kirken tribe for some unknown reason. Isha Khan's hands were stained with blood as he held onto his ears, groaning in pain. He shouted, Damn it! while confronting a man who questioned whether he had gone too far. Isha Khan admitted that he might have, as he took a puff of his cigarette, and explained that he felt more at ease when handling matters himself. It bothered him when a job wasn't done properly. The man grinned, tapping Isha Khan on the shoulder, warning him that approaching the royal family in his current state would not earn him any favors. Isha Khan returned the grin, staring at the man, and retorted that he doubted they would have a proper conversation with him regardless of the circumstances. The man admitted to Isha Khan that he despised wasting time with assassinations, and as a result, they had lost track of the gypsies. Khan was surprised to hear that they had lost track of the elusive group, acknowledging that the gypsies were skilled at hiding. He explained that if one was missed, it became incredibly challenging to find the rest of them. Khan then proposed sending out a team to search for the gypsies, inquiring if they had people available for the task. The man hesitated, stating that it might be difficult, but he would do his best to assemble a team. As they were discussing the matter, Isha Khan turned to see Genin, well, seems like her tattoo is some kind of recognition, something to acknowledge her presence. Genin greeted Isha Khan, addressing him as my lord. With urgency in her voice, she informed him that the princess had lost consciousness. Isha Khan, taken aback by the news, reprimanded Jenin for leaving the princess unattended and coming to him instead. Feeling remorseful, Jenin bowed in apology, rendering Isha Khan speechless. He stared at her intensely and emphasized that he could understand making mistakes once, but it would not be acceptable if it happened again. He then told her to stand and be more careful from now on. As he smoked, Isha Khan pondered the strange occurrence, remarking that it was unusual for someone to start bleeding for no apparent reason. I know right, it seems strange for her to bleed just like that. The man smirked and suggested that the princess's condition could be due to Isha Khan being too rough with her the previous night. Isha Khan considered the possibility, 
but revealed his suspicion that it might have been caused by the small amount of their medicine he had given her. Medicine or what he smokes, can that be considered a medicine? It doesn't even make sense to give her something like that to smoke Janin. And the man were visibly shocked, questioning why Isha Khan would give her the medicine when he knew it could be poisonous to normal people. Janin attempted to explain that it could also work as medicine when used in moderation. Isha Khan interrupted, stating that it was still strange for her body to react so severely that she vomited blood. His suspicion grew as he glared at them, saying that there seemed to be something more going on with the Estian princess, Leah. Hmm, I wonder if there was a deeper mystery surrounding Leah's sudden collapse. When Leah regained consciousness, she found herself surrounded by her concerned maids. Melissa, one of the maids, anxiously asked if she was okay and if anything hurt. Confused, Leah asked what had happened, and Melissa informed her that she had been sleeping the entire day. Leah tried to dismiss it, saying it was probably due to staying up late at the banquet the previous night. Melissa, while trying to believe Leah's explanation, couldn't shake the feeling that something more was troubling her mistress. It seemed to her that Leah had been under a lot of pressure lately, as even the prince had been startled when she suddenly collapsed. Well, he seemed like a caring brother at that moment, who'd have thought he'll behave that worried calling for a doctor. I'm sure you definitely didn't see that coming. Thankfully, a Kirkin woman came to Leah's aid just in time, carrying her to her room and immediately tending to her needs. Rather than relying on the royal servants, the Kirkin woman was the first to care for Leah. She lit a strange scented candle, which oddly enough seemed to have an immediate positive effect on Leah's condition. Melissa continued to look worried as she admitted that she had feared something terrible had happened to Leah. She then asked about Margrave Auberde, to which Melissa responded that he had been promptly taken care of as soon as he was found. With a mischievous smile, Melissa shared that they weren't sure how much he had drunk during the banquet, but they discovered him lying near a fountain with his pants off. It was an embarrassing scene, made even more scandalous when the departing nobles saw him in such a compromising state. Despite the situation, Melissa couldn't help but find the irony of it amusing. She pointed out that Margrave Auberde was a respected and powerful man in the kingdom, and it seemed unlikely that he would make such a careless mistake. Melissa continued, speculating that it didn't seem like Margrave Auberde had simply drunk too much. She suggested that perhaps he had been drugged. Leah, recalling the Margrave's attempt to abuse her, wondered if he had been given the same substance that was used on her. Leah thought to herself that Margrave Auberde was a person who valued his status and prestige above all else, but the question remained, who would do such a thing and why? Leah's mind was filled with questions and uncertainty as she struggled to make sense of the situation. Melissa, observing Leah's torn clothes and knowing she had changed them, asked if perhaps Leah had been having a secret affair. Leah replied that she had willingly engaged in the encounter, shocking Melissa. Melissa, concerned for Leah's well-being and reputation, asked if her thoughts were true, or if she had indeed been with the King of Kirkens. Leah assured Melissa not to worry about her prenuptial purity as she placed her hand affectionately on Leah's hand. Leah clarified that she did not intend to have an ongoing relationship with the King of Kirkens. Instead, their encounter had been a one-time event. Sardina was carefully cutting a white rose in a vase when Blaine barged in, causing her to turn and give him a warm smile. She welcomed him and mentioned that she was creating a scarf similar to the one made from the fox he had caught for her, gently touching the scarf. Blaine, seemingly annoyed, yelled that he hadn't caught the fox specifically for her. Sardina laughed and playfully asked him not to be harsh with her, reasoning that since the other servants he hunted with had caught it, it was as if he had caught it for her as well. Intrigued by what she was doing, Blaine asked if she was responsible for the princess coughing up blood. Sardina, noticing Blaine stepping on the flowers she had cut, questioned his thoughts on the matter. Blaine, glaring fiercely, accused her of being responsible for the princess's condition. Sardina, unfazed by his anger, asked what he thought about the whole situation. Blaine replied that it was obvious she was involved. Serdina gently caressed Blaine's face and questioned whether he was afraid of losing her, 
not only to Leah, but to the people he considered savages. Blaine hesitated, suggesting that Leah might just be stressed about maintaining her prenuptial purity before the marriage. Serdina chuckled and affectionately called him her son, advising him not to be foolish when it came to Leah. He ordered Serdina to leave Leah alone for the time being, to which she replied that the situation was unexpected for her as well. Agreeing that it would be best to give Leah some freedom for a few days, Serdina warned Blaine not to be angry with her. She playfully reminded him that if he continued to treat her this way, she might start talking to the Kirkins too. Is she threatening her son? Serdina patted Blaine on the head, changing the subject and suggesting they go have dinner. She also requested that he catch a deer for her next time, as she was growing weary of fox fur. Blaine, seemingly pacified by her gesture, agreed to her request. Leah sat on the chair, finally finding a moment of rest after the recent events. Though she was being closely watched by Blaine's personal guards, she was at least spared from attending the remainder of the banquet. Stretching her arms, she muttered about Serdina being her only visitor. A letter was delivered to Leah, and as she read its contents, she learned that the next royal cabinet meeting would discuss a new tax reform plan. Realizing the potential consequences, she knew this proposal would likely receive backlash from the people and the nobles. If the plan were to be approved, they would need to tread carefully to avoid dampening the strength and resources of the frontline army. Ouch. I'm sure Leah is both thankful for the peace and quiet she has now, but she's definitely going to be worried about dealing with the difficult political problems she knew were coming. Melissa entered the room and informed Leah about Margrave Oberti's gift. Leah instructed her to keep rejecting everything, wondering if Oberti thought his gifts would make her forget his actions. Melissa then told Leah about a lunch with His Majesty and the King of Kirkans, which the king ordered her to attend. Realizing her peace would be short-lived, Leah agreed to go. Melissa mentioned that the banquet would be over soon, and she wanted to gather more information before that. As they spoke, another maid walked in and whispered something to Melissa. Hmm, I wonder what's going on again? As the door opened, a male servant entered with a large box, explaining that it was a gift from the king of Kirkins. Leah was surprised by the gesture, and even more so when she discovered a note within. The king inquired about her well-being and expressed how difficult it had been not seeing her face. Ah, oh, such a romantic way to show care, but then that's trouble. After what he did to her, don't you think? Leah stared at the note in silence. As she opened the box, she discovered a beautiful dress made of purple silk. The maids were amazed, knowing how many nobles envied the sight of a kirkin wearing such an exquisite material, Leah, however, felt uneasy and interrupted, saying the dress should be returned. The maids were surprised by Leah's decision. Melissa warned her that the king had made it clear through his servant that if the gift was returned, he would not attend the banquet the following day. The next day arrived, and Leah was notified that the dress she had received from the king of Kirkins was ready for her. As she gazed up on the stunning purple silk dress, she couldn't help but reflect on her decision to keep the gift. Well, it's not like she had a choice, right? Deep in thought, Leah muttered that the king now knew her weaknesses. She was reminded of his words from the previous night, comparing her to delicate flowers. Touching her lips, she felt a mix of annoyance and intrigue. Realizing it wasn't the time to dwell on those feelings, she turned away and walked ahead. Leah knew that after lunch, she would meet with the finance minister, Laurent, and later in the evening, she had an appointment with Count Valtain Palatine. Her schedule was already full, leaving little room for distractions. Standing outside, Leah scanned the area for her carriage. Suddenly, she was startled by the presence of the King of Kirkins. He greeted her with a smile, saying, Long time no see, princess. Leah, surprised by his appearance, addressed him as, Your Highness and questioned why he had come, as the lunch was not being held there. Too bad, Leah sure wasn't prepared meeting this way. The king explained that according to the royal etiquette of her kingdom, it was customary for men to escort precious noblewomen. Leah couldn't help but wonder if he was suggesting that he would be her escort. Uncomfortable with the idea, 
she quickly responded that she didn't think it was the right situation for that kind of arrangement. Leah expressed her desire to return the dress to the king, but he refused. He asked if she was afraid of being mocked at lunch for wearing the dress. Boldly, Leah questioned if the king, like Count Oberde, was trying to capture her heart with this gift. Isha Khan laughed and questioned if it was really that easy to win her affection with a mere silk fabric. Okay, that's very intense, making it sound like Oberdi was making her look cheap. Moving closer to Leah, Isha Khan held onto her scarf and whispered that he had given her the dress because he was responsible for tearing her clothes. This revelation startled Leah, but Isha continued, questioning her decision not to wear the dress since he had chosen it because it would look beautiful on her. Leah stood her ground, insisting that she couldn't wear the dress. She then questioned why the king kept causing trouble for her. His expression darkened as he accused her of being too cold towards him, despite his devotion to her and the lengths he had gone to help her when she was in danger. He reminded her of the day he had saved her life and demanded that she return the favor. Leah glared fiercely at Isha Khan, while her maids felt ashamed by the closeness between the two. Leah, growing impatient, asked him to get to the point, and he finally requested that she accompany him to lunch. Surprised by the simplicity of his request, Leah agreed and walked ahead, instructing him to follow. Isha struggled to catch up as Leah walked briskly. He asked her to slow down, but she merely frowned and continued her fast pace. During their walk, Isha explained that he had ventured out specifically to see her, as it had become difficult for them to meet. He compared her to a princess trapped in a tower, and although Leah hesitated, she didn't deny his words. As they continued their walk, Leah felt a sense of relief at being outdoors after such a long time. Glancing at Isha, she wondered if he had planned this walk intentionally. Judging by his expression, feels like he actually did it intentionally. He then complimented her, saying she looked more beautiful today, causing Leah to look away, feeling a mix of emotions. Arriving at the palace, they were informed that Her Majesty was waiting inside. Leah couldn't help but feel uneasy being in the Queen's palace. However, she knew that coming with Isha Khan made the situation more bearable. As they entered the Queen's sight, Leah was <gasps> stunned to see Serdina wearing the very same dress that Isha had gifted to her. Okay, that's really crazy. Serdina greeted Leah warmly, using her affectionate nickname, and Leah noticed the food spread across the table. Leah stared at Serdina in shock, wondering why she was wearing the dress meant for her. Isha Khan, noticing Leah's expression, realized that Leah hadn't given the dress to Serdina. He complimented the queen's garment, expressing his surprise at seeing her in a Kirkian dress. Serdina explained that she was merely trying to make Isha feel at ease during their friendly reunion. What a considerate queen she's trying to portray there. Leah, however, grew suspicious, believing there was a traitor in the royal court. Leah knew that strangers were not allowed in the palace and that she had kept the dress a secret. Ouch. Then how did this happen? Could it be that the traitor is one of the maids that brought it to her? She concluded that one of the maids must have betrayed her trust, but realized that searching for the culprit could create division within the court and turn the maids against her. A wild imagination took hold of Leah, envisioning herself pushing the queen to the ground with a fork and forcefully removing the dress. Suddenly, a maid poured a drink into Leah's glass, causing her to question her own thoughts. That imagination sure wasn't her. She wondered if she was being overly sensitive about the situation. As they dined, the king mentioned the long-standing feudal conflict between the Estia and Kirkens tribes, hoping this reunion would pave the way to peace. Leah, seated across from Isha Khan, felt a growing similarity between them as she stared into his eyes. Suddenly, she felt a tickling sensation as Isha Khan discreetly slid his leg into her dress under the table. Leah scolded him in a whisper, chiding him for his lack of respect for the event's etiquette and asking him to stop. Despite the king continuing his speech, Isha Khan persisted in his attempts to arouse her. Her expressions caught Blaine's attention, who asked if she was ill. Leah didn't respond until Blaine raised his voice, demanding that she not make him repeat himself, attempting to brush it off as nothing, 
Blaine remained unconvinced. As he leaned down to retrieve a dropped spoon, he caught a glimpse of Leah's exposed leg, surprised by her seductive appearance. With a smile, Blaine turned to Isha Khan and inquired if he was enjoying the food, expressing concern that their cuisine might not suit his taste due to the limited ingredients available in their desert. Isha Khan, wiping his mouth, agreed that the food here tasted much better. He glanced at Leah, causing her to avert her gaze. Blaine then asked Aisha Khan about his marital status, wondering if he had any plans to take a bride from Estia through a predatory marriage. The king and queen were taken aback by Blaine's bold question, while Leah tried to intervene by holding his arm and calling his name. Undeterred, Blaine continued, asking Aisha Khan to refrain from such practices. He addressed him as the king of Kirkins and expressed his genuine desire for his people to shed their reputation as savage barbarians. Isha Khan stared at Blaine in shock. Isha Khan, glaring with joined hands, expressed his disappointment, stating that it seemed the Estia had no genuine intention of befriending his tribe, as he had initially believed. Leah tried to convey that it wasn't the case, but Isha Khan continued, explaining that he thought they were on the same page and questioning if Blaine considered this lunch an appropriate setting for interrogation. Leah interjected urging Isha Khan not to misunderstand their intentions and emphasizing that Blaine wanted peace with his tribe more than anyone else. She revealed that Blaine had been responsible for helping numerous captured Kirkin slaves. Blaine appeared defeated as Isha Khan inquired if Leah was protecting her brother, to which she confirmed. Isha Khan was left speechless, reminding Leah that it was the second time he had endured such treatment for her sake. Puzzled, Leah tried to understand what he meant by second time. She couldn't help but wonder what Isha Khan might expect from her in return for his tolerance. Just as Leah was about to take a bite of meat, Queen Sardina interrupted, asking if she was enjoying the meal. Leah, lost in thought, realized she hadn't eaten much due to the ongoing negotiations. Confused by Sardina's question, Leah pondered if the queen was suggesting that there was too much food or if she disliked the cuisine. Serdina continued, smiling persistently, and remarked that she had considered serving Kirkan's food, but ultimately chose to showcase the virtues of Estian cuisine. She even mentioned her decision to wear a Kirkan's dress as a gesture of respect. Yeah, yeah, what a smart excuse to give him. In a sudden and surprising move, Isha Khan approached Sardina and poured the remaining wine from his glass all over her, drenching her hair and dress. He nonchalantly remarked that it was his mistake and that he would get her a new dress in a more suitable color. The queen, her own dress stained with red wine, finished her glass while the king and servants watched in stunned silence. She then dropped the glass on the table, telling Isha Khan there was no need for a new dress. With a wide, almost eerie grin, she told him not to worry about it. As she announced her intention to change her clothes, everyone continued to watch in shock as she left the room. Wow, that's crazy. I'm speechless. Leah couldn't believe the queen's seemingly passive reaction to Isha Khan's actions. She wondered how the queen could let such a blatant act of disrespect pass as if it were nothing. This incident made it clear to Leah just how important the negotiations with the Kirkins king were, to the point where the royal family felt compelled to cooperate despite personal affronts. With renewed determination, Leah recognized the need to fulfill her role in this delicate diplomatic dance, even if it's something she's been wishing to do for long now. Isha Khan reached out to her with his hand, saying they should leave already. He'll escort her. As Leah prepared to take Isha Khan's hand and leave, Blaine's frustration grew. He sternly ordered her to sit back down and not leave with Isha Khan. Ignoring Blaine's command, Isha Khan grabbed Leah's hand, further infuriating Blaine. In the hallway, Leah asked Isha Khan to wait as he continued to drag her by the hand. Finally, she managed to free herself from his grip. Isha Khan, angered by the situation, raised his voice and questioned her actions. Seeing the fury in his eyes, Leah found herself at a loss for words. She began to rub her hand, which Isha Khan had grabbed too tightly. As he noticed her discomfort, Isha Khan's anger subsided, and he sighed. He apologized for using excessive force while holding her hand. Leah began to apologize on behalf of the royal family 
for any disrespect Isha Khan may have experienced. However, he interrupted her, questioning why she was always apologizing as if she were a sinner. He raised his voice, asking if the royal family was so important to her that she would cover up for the queen's actions. Disgusted by the situation, Isha Khan knelt before Leah, his tone softening. He asked her why she remained silent, reminding her that she had the right to express her anger when she felt mistreated. One can't always be a victim, don't you think? Isha Khan encouraged Leah to speak her mind and share her true thoughts. Leah's thoughts raced as she internally acknowledged her desire to wear the dress Isha Khan gave her, eat to her heart's content, and speak her mind freely. However, she recognized the futility of these wishes, as their lives were destined to separate in the future. Tears welling up in her eyes, Leah told Isha Khan not to pity her if he couldn't truly take care of her. Confused, he asked what she meant. Leah inquired if their connection was purely physical, pulling away from him and turning to leave. As Leah stormed out into the garden, Isha Khan grabbed her hand, causing her to yell at him to let her go. Surprised by her sudden temper, Isha Khan dragged her further into the garden. She continued to yell, pleading for him to release her. Ignoring her protests, Isha Khan embraced her tightly, asking what she would do if he vowed to take care of her. I'm sure his question took her by surprise. Back at the princess's manor, Melissa was shocked to hear Leah accuse one of the maids of informing the empress about her intention to wear the Kirkin's dress. Melissa, feeling personally responsible as the headmaid, asked Leah how she could make such an accusation. Melissa explained that she had worked hard to maintain discipline and balance among the maids, but acknowledged the difficulty in doing so. Melissa pleaded with Leah, expressing concern that if the princess became angry, believing that one of the maids had betrayed her and sold information to the empress, Melissa herself would likely be dismissed. Overwhelmed with emotion, Melissa confessed that if she had been born into a wealthy family, she might have had the courage to act differently in this situation. Moved by Melissa's words and tears, Leah hugged her tightly, comforting her like a daughter. Leah assured Melissa that she was valued and urged her not to blame herself for the situation. Melissa, still distraught, feared that the Empress would replace her for the upcoming trip to the border. She promised Leah that she would do her best to ensure she would be the one accompanying Leah. Leah watched as the headmaid left the room, promising to prepare a beautiful dress for her to wear the next day. Leah found herself torn between gratitude for Melissa's unwavering support and concern for her well-being. She knew that if Melissa insisted on following her and staying by her side, it could potentially jeopardize her future as well. As Leah's thoughts drifted, she remembered Isha Khan's question. Walking towards the window, Leah picked up a small medicinal box. In that moment, a glimmer of hope sparked within her. She realized that deep down, she yearned for a life filled with autonomy and genuine connection. There's more to discover in this manhwa. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you will never miss the next episode. Also, comment the name Leah.